but it is time to start. I uh, want to thank you for coming here to the Skagit Valley Church of Christ. Glad you come. Stick around. Let us meet you and talk to you. Come back at the next appointed time. Uh, tonight at 5, we have uh, prayer worship and uh, at 5 online on Zoom. And then Wednesday night, we have it both on Zoom and we have live service here. So at this time, will you bow with me, please? Dear Lord, we come to you this time thanking you for the time that we have to study your word, to bring it in our heart and pass it on to other people. Take care of us. Take care of those that need an extra helping hand. And let us go out through this life, always praising you. And let's especially remember it's your way, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I have to say it's so nice to hear everybody's voices is just chatting away and fellowshipping. It's great. Glad you're here, our guest. I will call upon the Lord. <clears throat> I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Jesus Christ, he died for me, and he took away my sin. I will live with him for eternity. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. <clears throat> Better than life. <clears throat> An old song, but uh, maybe new to some of you, but <clears throat> I think you'll catch on. Better than life. In a dry and weary land where is no water, my soul is thirsting for you. I have seen you in the sanctuary, beheld your power and glory. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Your love is better than life. Your love is better than life. Earnestly I seek you. My soul is thirsting for you, cause your love is better than life. Because you are my help, I will be singing in the shadow of your wing. I'm staying close beside you, your right hand upholds me. I think of you through the night. With singing lips I will praise, and my soul will be satisfied. Your love is better than life. Your love is better than life. Earnestly I seek you. My soul is thirsting for you. Cause your love is better than life. Oh God, you are my God. 
Earnestly I seek you, I'm longing for you. Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, I'm longing for your love is better than life, your love is better than life, earnestly I seek you, my soul is thirsting for you, for your love is better than life, your love is better than life. Good morning. Uh, Luke 21, uh, Jesus talks about uh, the widow offering all that she had and uh, which is giving more than uh, rich people. But an interesting thing that I was looking for uh, when I was doing some research, at least in my research, uh, tithe was not in the New Testament, a number of times in the Old Testament. It's more of what, uh, I think it, the, what I stumbled upon is that it's, the New Testament, God really looks at the heart of someone, just as the rule of do not commit adultery, uh, if you lust in your heart, uh, that's what he's looking at, what's in your heart. So uh, this time, we just give back to uh, what God has blessed us with, and uh, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the blessings you have given us. Pray that uh, this church may use what we've given back to you to reach the people, to expand your kingdom, to show the love that you've shown us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing and be happy. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, grand. Sing and be happy. Press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you. He will keep your soul. Let all be faithful. Look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing and be happy. Press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you. He will keep your soul. Let all 
Be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Amen. He knows just what I need. A friend of mine introduced this song to me years ago, and it's always been, you just listen to the words, and uh, it uh, has a lot of meaning. He knows just what I need. My Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands each lonely heartache. He understands because he cares. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. My Jesus knows when I am burdened. He knows how much my heart can bear. He lifts me up when I am sinking and brings me joy beyond compare. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. When other friends seem to forget me, when skies are dark, when hope is gone, by faith I feel his arms about me and hear him say, My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. Amen. Today's scripture is found in Acts 5, verse 40 through 42. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for, their name, for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Well, greetings, church family. Good to see everybody. I'm glad to see you. Glad to be here. Um, I'm feeling better today after a, a week that it's hard to describe as a great week, but it, it's done. Uh, a lot less stress now. Teddy's home finally. Praise God. Thank you, everybody, for your prayers and all. Uh, Jenny's home taking care of her. So hopefully she'll have a quick recovery. Uh, and 
drum roll. I got my truck back. Now you may not, a lot of you are saying, so I didn't know you didn't have it. Well, um, back in July, as I was going down to Oregon to uh, visit my dad, I got rear-ended by a guy. You can see he got the worst of it, but anyway, damage wasn't that bad. Little fender bender. But I dropped my truck off at the body shop on Thursday, August 26th. And it should have been like a week or less of repair. I got it back this last Thursday, exactly four weeks after I dropped it off. I'll tell you, it was frustrating. Finally finished, exactly four weeks later. And there's a story to that, but I'm not going to whine about it. No, not much. It's a little bit. Okay, so we have a passage this morning. It's easy to understand. But in some ways, profoundly difficult to grasp and implement, you know, all at the same time. When you hear the story, it's pretty obvious that not everybody was thrilled about the good news that Jesus, who is the indisputable Christ of God, the Messiah, has been raised from the dead. Not everybody thought that was a good thing. His resurrection is, of course, the basis of our hope of resurrection. The early church is on the move. It's growing exponentially from a few hundred souls to more than 8,000 within two weeks of Jesus ascending into heaven. A mere two months since he was crucified and then raised from the dead by God. That good news is spreading and blessing everyone who hears it and responds in faith. That's very clear. You can't miss that when you read Acts. There's great joy among the believers. Fellowship is at a zenith, possibly greater than any time since, even up to the present. We saw last week that they were of one heart and soul. That's a description found nowhere else in Scripture. The closest you can get is when Joshua, at the end of his life, reminded the Israelites that they knew in their hearts and souls that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But that has to do with God's coming through on his promises. In Acts, the phrase, they were one in heart and soul, it's a description of how deeply and tightly each of their lives were intertwined, interwoven into one another. How rich the fellowship was that they were experiencing. How they had everything in common, and no one among them had had any needs. Every need they had was taken care of by the church. Their fellowship was characterized by boldness. That's a key word in these early chapters. Boldness. And they're speaking the word of God. Ananias and Sapphira. They represented this, you know, that it's a still present human tendency towards self-interest. That's the single most destructive known force to fellowship and oneness. No danger or threat outside the community of faith is as foreboding or threatening than that that comes from within. Self-interest. Self-interest is at the absolute core of the sin of Adam and Eve. And that was ever present even here in the persons of Ananias and Sapphira. Their destruction, their deaths, illustrates how utterly unacceptable and out of place Self-interest is among the fellowship of believers. It's like cancer against oneness. If we're truly serious about being the church, and I hope we are, then this is a crucial and fundamental warning to us. Now Luke tells us in verse, verses 12 through 16 that the daily life of the church was characterized by signs and wonders and togetherness and Though there was great fear among them because of what happened to Ananias and Sapphira, which left some of them a little gun shy, you know, about joining, joining in, most of the people enthusiastically held them in high esteem. This is now, this now very large fellowship is rapidly growing even larger. Multitudes of men and women are being added to the Lord. That's a crucial distinction. It says in chapter 2, verse 41, that 3,000 were added. 
But Luke doesn't say to what. We assume to the church, which is, that's not necessarily incorrect. In chapter 5, verse 4, we again assume, again, not incorrectly, that 5,000 more were added to the church. Though it doesn't literally say they were added to anything. But here, and in later on in chapter 11, verse 24, that phrase, added to the Lord, is added. It's used. I don't believe that to be an accident or coincidence. Jesus is personally the restoration of Israel. Restored, renewed Israel is not a new version of official Israel. It's not the institutional Israel or the organized religious entity of Israel. It's a person. Jesus, the Christ of God, who sits in glory at the right hand of God as absolute sovereign of everything, everything that exists. He is the restoration of Israel. And we pointed before, pointed out that we are his body. He is the head. Okay, this metaphorical language is not coincidental. The apostle Paul is pretty fond of that. He uses it too. The purposeful nature of it, it is purposeful and rich in meaning. We know we make up parts of the body. But it's the corporate fellowship relationship of the whole that gives life and meaning to the parts. Try cutting off your finger and see if it can regenerate like a starfish. It's got to be part of your body. We need one another in fellowship in order to be part of Jesus, the head. To say repentant, baptized believers are added to the church that's a highly nuanced statement. Do you mean the institutional church? The one with a building and a sign in the parking lot? Well, that raises a lot of irreconcilable issues. Do you mean the organized, regulated entity of the church? Again, many issues. No, the church is the body of Christ, without reference to the institution. If we inside this building grasp that we are added to the Lord and that Jesus is the restoration of Israel, then inasmuch as we are fostering oneness and embracing our mission, we are the church. I hope this is all becoming clearer and clearer as we travel through Acts. Well, this early church was very busy healing the sick, casting out unclean spirits, spreading the good news, just as if Jesus himself were still among them in the flesh. Even people from neighboring towns were being brought to the apostles for healing. The church was performing with power and boldness. Even Peter's shadow was having an impact. What an amazing depiction of their activities. But something is awry. Something's wrong. As usual, there's a backstory. Now, I mentioned earlier that not everyone was thrilled about the good news being preached, you know, about the resurrected Jesus. This, is, this now has become the second incident within days of one another that the apostles are in conflict with official Israel. The high priest and all his minions and the Sadducees who pointed out, you know, we pointed out last week that they categorically denied the resurrection in any way, shape, or form. And they were especially irritated that the apostles were teaching that Jesus was raised from the dead. Well, this is an important little clue that helps us see what Luke wants us to see. There's a play on words here, so to speak, regarding the word raised or raised up. The high priest rose up. The word means to stand up, but it's also a synonym for resurrection. The apostles are found standing in the temple, proclaiming Jesus. The word for stand is from the same root word for raise up. In verse 30, Peter says that God raised up Jesus, but he uses a different word there for resurrection. It's the word normally used. In verse 34, Gamaliel stands up, same word used for the high priest. And he tells of two bad guys. 
who rose up, same word, and came to nothing. But in the end, by implication, it's the Holy Spirit who stood up the apostles to be even more bold proclaiming Jesus. So what's happening in this story? Well, the high priest and other officials of official Israel confronted the apostles who are now guilty of unauthorized preaching. Strike two. They were filled with jealousy and threw the apostles into prison. The wording is much stronger this time than the last time. However, unlike last time where the apostles were released the next morning, here an angel of the Lord opens the doors and let them out and commanded them to go stand. There's that word again. Stand in the temple. The most high profile, provoking place around. And speak all the words of this life, it says. This is no ordinary angel. He is highly significant. It's a discussion we don't have time this morning for. Sorry about that. The words of this life he refers to is the life in the Lord. The resurrected life of the restored, renewed people of God. They obey the angel of the Lord without hesitation. They enter the temple and do exactly what they're told to do. They begin to teach. So while the apostles are in the temple proclaiming, the leaders assemble the Sanhedrin, the same council that had, had earlier condemned Jesus. They sent for the defendants, but they were no longer in the Huskah. They were gone. Well, panic must have set in. They looked, but they couldn't find the prisoners because they weren't there. They were greatly perplexed, it says, at a complete loss. But someone spotted them. They were in the very place where they were arrested earlier for doing the very thing that got them arrested in the first place. Only now the guards have to be a little stealthier when they rearrest them, these lawbreakers. While the leaders are growing more agitated, the people are growing more attracted to the healing and the preaching. And the guards fear the people. They're afraid they're going to get stoned if they get too aggressive. So when they get to the council, the apostles are told, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Wouldn't even say the name Jesus. Sorry. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Because that's the other little hint in this passage. The leaders are filled with jealousy and now filled with rage. Because the apostles have filled Jerusalem with their teaching. And Peter responds with the famous words that we often take out of context. We must obey God rather than men, he says. Okay, this is not a blanket principle that gets us off the hook when we perceive that authorities or you know, people in charge are attempting to pressure us into compromise or participate in something immoral. Okay, that's a solid principle. It's a sound principle for other reasons. But this statement here of Peter's is more specific. If we are actively proclaiming the words of this Jesus life and are being pressured to shut up and keep to ourselves, then we must absolutely disobey that prohibition. Peter goes on to affirm that it's worse than them simply trying to pin Jesus' death on the leaders. It's actually a rock-solid fact that they're responsible. They are complicit in hanging him on the cross. Jesus is both leader and savior. Because that word leader only appears four times in scripture. It refers to a ruler or a prince, like a founder or guardian of city, a, a pioneer. He's the one who goes ahead of his people to prepare the way and establish them. Paul said Jesus is Lord and Christ in his first speech back in chapter two. Here he is leader and savior. Peter says we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Well, Peter's words have a profound impact on the council. They become enraged. Very strong word. 
They don't just want to silence them. They want to kill them. But before things completely dis disintegrate altogether, Gamaliel steps in. That is, here's the word again. He rises up. He's a man with authority and credibility that rivals the high priest himself. He's a respected scholar and teacher. Gamaliel comes from a long line of especially important teachers that includes Hillel himself. That's, we'll talk more about him some other time. Very important man. Gamaliel was a Pharisee. Paul studied under this very same Gamaliel. That's something we're going to learn about a little bit later in another lesson. Well, Gamaliel reminds them of two previous troublemakers who rose up, that word again, and led people astray. Judas and Judas. We know virtually nothing else about them or what they actually did you know, specifically. The short of it is they flared up like sawdust in a campfire and then faded into obscurity. Nothing at all came of their exploits. He employed that, or implied that this new Jesus movement has the same potential for failure. He urged the council to leave them alone and allow them to self-destruct if what they claim is from men, they'll crash and burn just like Judas and Judas. And here's the kicker. If it's from God, there's nothing they can do to stop it. No matter how high they rise up, nothing they can do. In fact, they might actually find themselves opposing God. That's a very precarious situation to find yourself in. Highly prophetic because ironically, they actually are indeed fighting against God. Well, they took his advice, but they also took the liberty to beat the dickens out of him, you know, before letting them go. That's the same word used to describe the beating that Jesus received before his crucifixion. And they charged, that is, they commanded the apostles to keep their traps shut about this Jesus guy. It's actually stronger than that. To speak in the name of someone is to speak by the authority of someone who actually has authority. They don't want to legitimize this movement or its leader. They don't want to, them to, or Jesus, to appear to have authority of any kind. And again, ironically, Jesus has supreme authority that overrides any other authority ever. To me, the most incredible outcome is the fact that no sooner had they left the council, and probably pretty bloody, they immediately resume the very thing that got them beat up in the first place. Every day in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. But the craziest thing of all, is how the apostles themselves perceived all of this. There was no poor me. No, it isn't fair. No, wait till my lawyer gets hold of you. They didn't cry or whine or engage in second guessing their ability to make rational decisions. They didn't strike back. They didn't go to the press to shed light on the injustice. You know, CNN didn't cover this. Actually, they didn't even focus on or, or blame the Sanhedrin or any other leaders at all. They did the most amazing thing. They went on their way rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Worthy. Worthy of suffering. Pain and suffering. Woohoo! Let's get some. Are we worthy? Are you worthy? That seems like a trick question, doesn't it? Because it assumes that we're going to get into trouble for actually talking about Jesus. You can't ask if you're worthy to do the time if you're not willing to do the crime. Are we going to rise up? Or are we going to shrink back in fear? Do you think the opposition the apostles suffered was the end of suffering? It is not. But this story isn't 
applicable only to persecution from the state or the official entities, or even the official church. That is the traditional consensus of the majority that demands conformity. Be conformed to scripture only. Even if your imperfect understanding causes you to question things. So many things around us are rising up nowadays in ways that are downright terrifying. It's all around us and growing. You don't have to watch very much news for very long to see this. Now, I'm not going to name every threat because you already know what they are. Anti this, defund that, racist this and that, cancel culture, left wing, right wing, conservatism, liberalism, capitalism, communism. These are some of the big things that we get bombarded with all the time. There are a lot of things far less tangible, like the perceptions and attitudes of maybe local organizations or just the people who live around us. Even our school system itself isn't exactly your friend of faith. So what it all means is pressure. Family, acquaintances, people you run into at the grocery store, friends you may have had for years. The times they are changing and mostly not for the good. There's tremendous pressure to divide us, not just to divide the faithful in Christ, but to divide our communities, our nation. You know, I was young during the 1960s, but I remember them pretty well. There were so many things changing and so much pressure to abandon anything traditional. Upheaval, protests, radical movements. Based on my recollection of those days, it appears to me we are very near to outdoing anything that happened back then. It's not a good time. A still small voice in the wilderness that calls out, prepare the way of the Lord, is drowned out by angry voices of opposition. A people who seeks to know the Lord and to serve him are ridiculed and sneered at, judged for being judgmental, out of touch, silly, purveyors of myths and fairy tales. To a gender-confused, racially chaotic, cancel-happy world, we are seen as not just irrelevant, but downright dangerous. So who's oppressing the oppressors? Who's oppressing the oppressed? Who is damaging the fragile psyche of triggered college freshmen? Who are those straw men, those old, you know, offensive, homophobic, misogynistic, lovers of unborn children? It's us. True or not, fair or unfair, we are the problem. If you believe the Bible is true, that the story of God and creation is the story that defines reality, that there is something real and absolute that defines right and wrong, and what's moral and immoral. If you believe there's such a thing as sin, that there is some kind of standard beyond each individual's conscience, then you, my friend, you are the problem. Is anyone surprised that the technique, tactic, and procedure of choice is to silence you? Pressure. Well, fortunately for them, for those who tried to pressure us, a lot of us aren't waiting around for the great reset or the big correction. We'll just silence ourselves. No pushback required because we're just not going to push. It's so much easier and safer to keep it to yourself, isn't it? Don't rock the boat. Keep a low profile. Don't draw attention to yourself. Just quietly read your Bible, whisper your prayers, quietly drive to church with your eyes forward. Don't look around. Put in your two hours and check the block on this Jesus stuff. Prayer, teaching, preaching, fellowship, all that good stuff. 
then go home in peace. Safely sail along in a boat that doesn't rock. You see the problem? Last week, we looked at the fundamental characteristics of the early church. Devotion to the teaching of the apostles. Devotion to the fellowship. To the breaking of bread. And devotion to prayer. The Holy Spirit was present and active in a big way. Aside from alleviating suffer through healing and casting out unclean spirits, the primary mission of the church was and is to proclaim Jesus. Proclaim him when people swarm in multitudes to hear and obey. Proclaim when no one's listening. Proclaim in the face of stinging opposition. Proclaim Jesus at the risk of their very lives. And, and, and when, and I mean when, when it all goes south, rejoice that we are counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name Jesus. Be silly little people. Be worthy. Count your blessings. Suffering for Jesus is a blessing. It goes against good sense to be happy, you know, about being assaulted or threatened. If we are the church, that we are required to proclaim the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't be under any illusions. If we get serious about being the church, it's only a matter of time. The pain train is in the station, ready to ride. Be worthy, church. Are we even looking for the opportunity to proclaim Jesus? Out loud, in private conversations, in the presence of strangers, in social media, our email, you know, where uh, social media is where you're going to get pushed back very swiftly and severe. With our children. Everywhere we go, are we taking Jesus and putting him on display? Be worthy to suffer. Be worthy and rejoice. Will you bow with me, please? Holy Father, we want to pray for, for your people, for your church, for all of us. Father, let your Holy Spirit be mighty among us to remind us that we are here as the body of your son, Jesus Christ, to do in this world what he himself would do. To be Jesus in the world and to proclaim him. Father, we pray that you will silence every voice that seeks to silence us. And help us to lift up our voice to proclaim your son. Without any regard whatsoever of the price that we might pay for that. And let us rejoice if we are found worthy to suffer for doing what it is you want us to do. Proclaim your son. All this we offer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. There is no other name. <clears throat> Stand and sing. <laughs> there is no other name. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other name. Every tongue will confess the blessed name of Jesus. There is one who can heal the diseases of the body. There is one who can heal the diseases of the soul. Others try and pretend that they have this kind of power. But there's no other name that you really need to know. 
There is no other name. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other name. Every tongue will confess the blessed name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord, we have found complete redemption. In the name of the Lord, we have hope beyond the grave. And there's no other way to be sure we're bound for heaven. There is no other name with the awesome power to save. There is no other name. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other name. Every tongue will confess the blessed name of Jesus. Every tongue will confess the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, come share the Lord. <clears throat> we gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here, everyone belongs, finding our forgiveness here. We in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. No one seen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. One more time, brothers and sisters, we gather at the table. Kind of like to read out of Luke. That's being read a lot this morning. And then he said unto them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And this is the one thing that just grinds right into my mind. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he proceeded down to where he took bread, gave thanks, broke it. He gave it to him and said, this is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. That sums it up. The greatest gift that ever has been given was when God gave his son in payment of our sins. Will you bow with me as we approach our Father? Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, for sending him, for his coming, for his living and showing us, dying upon that cross, carrying our sins, and defeating death for us. We thank you for all of this, Father. We praise your name, and we pray that as we partake of this bread, this symbol of his precious body, we will look in our mind's eye and see our Savior, arms stretched, saying, this is how much I love you. In his precious, loving name we pray. Amen. Now, and to continue, in the same way, he also took the cup after the supper and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. That's exactly it. His body was a mess by our standards. He had been whipped. And that blood, as it dripped down, was washing away our sins. Grave thought and a beautiful thought. You bow with me as we thank our Father for this cup. Again, Father, we come again to your throne of mercy, thanking you for the grace that you have given us, thanking you for your Son, for the pain and anguish that he suffered for us, for the blood that drained out of his body, washing away our sins forever. Father, we thank you and praise your name in your son's name. And we pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, symbol of Christ's precious blood, we will do so in a manner bringing honor and glory under the name of Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful.
merciful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim, kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Amen. Family, think about that message and that challenge. Are we going to rise up? Are we going to hide, take the low road? be the least conspicuous as we can be, we're going to rise up. I challenge you, go back and read Acts 5. There were a couple of slides mislabeled that said Luke 5. It's okay. We know we're in Acts. Somebody want to get that? Might not be for me. Um, go back and read what the first century did and, and what made them successful and challenged. And let's do the same thing. There's a, there's a lot going on. If you want to know how you can rise up this week, um, there's a lot going, uh, today after worship, we're going to have a meeting. Melissa will probably have us in here, uh, for LTC and the kickoff. It's only what seven short months until L LTC. It'll be here before you know it. So, uh, I hope there's a lot of people willing to help. If, if, if we need praying people, we need teaching people, we need encouraging people. So plan to be in here and Melissa, I'm sorry. I was looking too far back. You want to meet in here after Worship? Okay. Um, tonight at six, we do prayers online at five. And then tonight at six, there's ladies movie night. Show up here, bring some finger foods, a uh, great time of fellowship, great time to kick back and watch a movie. Um, that'll be a good time. There's no, there's no age limit. So from zero to, if you have two zeros somewhere in your age bracket, uh, show up. We'll, we'd love to have you. Um, uh, make sure I, oh, Sandy Deathridge. There's an update on the bulletin out in the, out in the uh, foyer. Sandy, we've been praying for him. He, he came here a couple months ago, July. We've also got his address in the bulletin. So I know our official campaign for encouragement notes is over. It doesn't mean we can't keep encouraging him. Uh, send him and Cindy a note. We, we need to make sure that we are praying for those who are speaking God's word and truth. Uh, Prayer requests. There's there's a lot to praise for and to keep praying for. Teddy's home. Thank God for that. Dean is home. Dean spent a uh, better part of the week in the hospital. He's home. Um, let's keep lifting him up. Uh, you may or may not have heard Rhonda Fitzpatrick fell and broke her pelvis. So let's be praying for her and Jim as she's recovering. I called her the other day and she's hurting. Uh, not a lot that the doctor can do. They got to wait a little bit and see if they're going to need surgery or not. But let's be lifting her up. Um, let's be praying. Family, you can, you can look through the list. But let's be enough in each other's lives 
that we know what's going on and we can be actively encouraging and lifting each other up. Uh, we're going to close in prayer. At least we're going to close right now in prayer. We're going to be praying all through the day, I know. We're going to be praying tonight. We're going to be praying through the week. Let's be God's family and rise up whatever the situation. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you are so good. You are so good when we are not. When we fall and fail, Father, we thank you that you are a God of grace. Lord, we thank you that you work so mightily, that you answer our prayers, that there are, are healings and recoveries. And Lord, we, we thank you for those. We also lay at your feet those things that are on our hearts, the, those that need healing, those that are struggling, those that are searching for you. Lord, you are, you are the God of all. You are the God of all creation. We thank you. We thank you that you have blessed us with your word and that we have the hope. Lord, help us to speak in boldness your name and your love and your truth through this week, whether it be at work or at school or at the grocery store. Lord God, let there be no doubt that we serve you. Lord, I ask that you would be with each of us this week, that we would see those opportunities, that there would be uh, a turning and a devoting to your word. Lord, we thank you for all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, family, our congregational scripture is from 2 Corinthians 4.18, if you'll follow along after me. So we do not focus on what is seen, But what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. Hey, there's one more thing we need to do today. There's a birthday today. Glenda is celebrating. And there's a birthday on Wednesday. Belle is back in the um, nursery, but, but you can wish her a happy birthday. So why don't we wish them happy birthday? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Glenda and Bella. Happy birthday to you. All right, family, let's spend some time fellowship.